Hey, good evening, Foothill. How are you? Good to see you all here tonight. Thanks for coming out. Um, uh, before we get started here tonight, I just want to draw your attention to this card. You, there's one of these should be sitting in front of the seat in front of you. Grab this while I'm talking. Uh, this is a, a way to, to get involved at Foothill Church. It's our volunteer card. And um, uh, as you heard Kelly say, this is the, the best way for you to get connected to the life of the church is through serving. And, uh, and if you want to have an opportunity to serve in the church, serve God, uh, the, we, we feel like this is, this is uh, not just serving the church, this is serving the Lord. Uh, uh, do us a favor, fill this out. At the end of the service, when the bucket comes by, drops in the bucket. Somebody will get a hold of you this week uh, and get you involved. Uh, we, would, we would love to have you, you do that. Um, uh, we, we, we just feel like this is going to help not only the church and help it make a better place for other people, but also uh, help you in your, in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So we'd love for you to fill one of those out and, uh, and turn it in uh, when the bucket comes by at the end. Uh, well, before we get started today, we've done this every week, so i got to do it today. Um, let's see, how many parents are in this room? Raise your hand if you're a parent, okay? Uh, how many of you have one child? Keep your hand, right? How many of you have uh, two children? Keep them up. Three? Four? Wow, oh, look at this. Five? Five? Wow, five kids. Six? Anybody with six kids? Six? Ed and... Anybody beat Six? Wow, that's awesome. Hey, hey, Kelly, would you do me a favor and take this back to Ed uh, and Connie back there? Wait, raise, raise your hand, Ed. We're going to give you one of these books. That's kids, by the way? Wow. All right, let's talk. To, let's see. How, how many of your grandparents in this room? If I give you two books, that's not going to count. Um, all right, so, so how many of you have uh, uh, three grandkids? Four. Four. Five. Six. Okay, go. Oh, look at this. Give me a fight. Seven? Eight? No. How many? Seven? Seven. Seven. Oh, and? Thirteen. Thir <laughs> Gus and Wanda, you already got a book. So, so, so hey, here's what we're going to do. G give it to next to Kevin still right there. Give it to his wife. And, and you, you go get one out in our resource area. You can have one for free, too. If you've got seven grandkids, you need one. <laughs> All right, well, today we want to talk uh, about maybe one of the most important things we can talk about when it comes to marriage, and that's, um, that's sex. And uh, uh, there probably isn't a more relevant topic, maybe. Uh, certainly, if you want to talk about felt needs that, that people want to talk about and yet less talked about in a church setting than, than sex. Uh, we live in a culture that is bombarded by sexuality. I mean, you're going to get it on TV, you're going to get it in advertisements, in movies, on billboards, uh, on the way home. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. So over the next three weeks, I just want to let you in on where we're going. We're going to talk about some aspect of sex and sexuality uh, and the effects and all that on marriage. And, um, and, and then three weeks or two weeks from today, yeah, I think, I think it is, uh, two weeks from today, we're going to end the series uh, with, a, with a question and answer session that we're, uh, uh, we're calling Can We Blank, okay? And, uh, and as you can tell by the title, uh, we're inviting you to ask honest questions and we'll give you uh, as honest an uh, answer as we can. In fact, my wife and I are going to be up here together and, and uh, she's told me she will be brave enough for that one time to be up here and help answer those questions with me. Um, and so we want you to come. We want you to, to be a part of that. Uh, answer questions. You'll be able to text them in. We're not going to ask you to answer, ask them live. We, we nobody nobody want to do that. Um, and so you can text them in and, and, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them. Now, maybe you're thinking... Okay, we're talking about marriage. Why do we need to spend three weeks on this topic of sex? Well, I, I think because uh, it's a big deal, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, we're, we're, like I say, it's, it's, it's on everybody's mind. It's an issue for a whole lot of people. And uh, one of the things that distinguishes marriage from every other relationship that you and I can have is sex. Uh, like... Uh, I have a lot of relationships. I better be only having sex with one woman, and that's my wife. Um, so, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to try to talk as honestly as a pastor about this as openly as I can without being crass or crude. 
um, because the truth is we, and I, when I say we, I'm talking about the Christian subculture have got to give over our fear of talking about this subject. And I'm going to try to be honest with you about me and Michelle without creeping you out. And, and, and so you're going to feel maybe some freedom to be more honest with each other. And maybe husbands and wives can have this conversation uh, with one another. That's, that's what we want you to be able to do. We want you to have great marriages. We want you to have marriages that glorify God. So let me talk a little bit about Michelle. And I, again, I'm not going not gonna to make anybody, you know, get yuck, please stop. Uh, we've, been, we've been married for 23 years uh, plus. And for 23 years, we've been working on our sex life, okay? I, I don't know how to say it. Uh, that, that's part of, uh, of a marriage. Um, but the truth is, it's not always been easy. Um, we've had to have some very difficult conversations. I mean, I, I got to tell you, Having conversations about sex and marriage might be one of the hardest conversations you can have in marriage, right? I mean, the, the, you both have ideas, you, you both come into with expectations, and yet when you finally get married, there's something about that conversation that's very, very hard to have. Um, and so there have been hurt feelings, there's been rejection in our marriage, me to her, her to me. Um, and, and part of that was because we came into marriage. Uh, with different expectations about what sex was going to mean within the context of a relationship. Now, let me, let me tell you a little bit more about Michelle. Both Michelle and I grew up in solid uh, Christian homes where we were taught to love Jesus. And this is, this is part of the, the environment we grew up in. And, and part of learning to love Jesus was what Jesus says to obey all of his commands. And one of those commands, one of the things you find in scripture is that scripture is going to tell us and what our parents taught us is you don't have sex before you're married. Okay, now, let me, let me, may, and I, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to generalize tonight about some things about men and women when it comes to sex. But it's interesting to me how that message is filtered through guys and through girls. And this isn't just me. I mean, I've, I've, we've counseled with a lot of couples, and I know this, this tends to be true, okay? Okay, guys, we hear you can't have sex till you're married. And so, you know, I'll just tell you about myself. I'm like, well, then I can't wait to get married so I can have a lot of sex, right? In fact, please, Jesus, don't return until I get married because I, I want to have sex, okay? I, I, I want that, okay? Now, Michelle, on the other hand, grew not thinking you know, that, that she never wanted to have sex. It was more, okay, a good girl doesn't do that before she's married. Okay, so this is her background. She's thinking this. And, and by the way, I, I want to just say real quickly, if you've had sex before marriage, this is not a, a night where I'm going to bash you. I, I'm, there's forgiveness. There's mercy. There's grace. And, and I'm just telling you our story here for a second, okay? So, so Michelle, Michelle and, and so she filters this don't have sex before marriage as... Okay, that waits until I'm married, and until I'm married, it's bad, it's dirty, it's gross, whatever. We're not supposed to do that. She, she knows, right, she knows that inside of marriage it's appropriate, it's acceptable, but it's this psychological hurdle, and maybe some of you ladies can relate to this. Um, it's a psychological hurdle to say that we got married on May 6, 1989, that on, you know, 10 a.m. on May 6, 1989, we, we, we couldn't do anything, and at 11.30, it was okay for us to see each other naked and have sex. I mean, that's, that's like, and she's like, whoa, you know, the two hours ago, this was dirty. And now it's okay. So, so the, 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 the title of the message, and this comes out of the book, and so I'm trying to just let this be a support. If you want to read more and get more, you know, uh, uh, another perspective on it, you pick up the book. We've got it out at the Resource Center. But the title of the book is Sex, God, Gross, or Gift. And I think that's a great title. Because honestly, I believe this is the problem that when we talk about sex within marriage, this is the problem that most couples wrestle with. I'm not saying this is your only problem or whatever. This, this, is, this may be part of what happens. Okay, if I can generalize, Michelle, and, and we're using, I know, it's, it's, they're all G's and so they work, okay? But, but understand what I'm doing here. Michelle tended to come at this whole thing of our sex life at, from, the, from the sex is gross side, okay? I, like a lot of guys, tend to come at it as sex is God, okay? What we needed to see is what God wants us to see in Scripture, so, 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 uh, so, so where, where did things go wrong, right? If, if sex is a gift, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, why, why don't we see it that way? 
Why do some of you, men or women, tend to see it as God? Why do some of you, men or women, tend to see it as gross, as something to be avoided, as something not to be enjoyed? Well, what went wrong? Now, we've looked at this passage before, but I want to, in order to figure out what went wrong, I want to show you first uh, what God intended, okay? And out of that, then you can see what got fractured, okay, and, and, and why things maybe broke down. So we looked at this passage actually a couple weeks ago, but we're going to go through it again because I want you to see it from this vantage point, okay? So we're in Genesis chapter 2. It's on page 2 of those Bibles that are sitting next to you if you want to grab a Bible. And, uh, and, and I, want to, I want you to just kind of follow along with me, and we'll go through this pretty quickly, and then I want to, I want to kind of apply it to, to your life and mine. Okay, so Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. Okay, I think every guy in the world who gets married agrees with that statement. I don't want to be alone, right? I don't want to be alone. I'm going to get married. Okay? And then he keeps going. So he says, I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So the man gave name to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Now we've talked about this, but just imagine the scene again. Okay, so there he is. And Adam's like, maybe God at some point comes up to Adam. He's like, Adam, uh, you shouldn't be alone. I see this and I'm going to make you a wife. And Adam's like, great, a wife. What's a wife? You know, I, I've never seen one of those. So God says, well, before I introduce you to what a wife is, I want to show you some other animals. And so he brings, you know, he's, he's, he's parading past, and, you know, here's a, here's a horse, and here's a pig, and here's an armadillo. And Adam's got to be like, I, is that one? Because is that my wife? Because I don't, that's not really desirable to me. And, um, and, and, you know, please, God, that's not her. And he's like, no, no, Adam, it's all right. Just keep going. You know, he's like, whew, thank you, Jesus. That's not my wife. That's an armadillo. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, so, so he's, he's like looking at all this, and God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now make you one. So look at verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs, he closed up the place with, uh, its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now this, what a day. What a day, right? I mean, here, here, here's God brings Adam a naked woman. They're both naked. Okay, that's, guys, you, that's like, wow, that'd just be a great wedding, right? Um, and here they are, and, 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 and Adam, look at how he responds. The man said, this is at last bone of my bones. Thank God, this is not an armadillo. She's like me, a flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. I mean, every time I, I read this section, I think of like, you know, those, those scenes in films or whatever where, you know, he finally sees the woman and there she is off in the distance and her hair is blowing and there's kind of this hallelujah chorus going off in the background. He's like, whoa, that's my wife. You know, this is awesome. And so there she is. This is my, this is a woman and God's giving her and bringing her to me and I, she gets to be mine and I get to be hers. And so then God concludes it in verse 24 with this. And I want you to just notice, he says a few things. He's going to say three things to to, to us. Okay, number, he says, therefore a man shall, guys, listen up, number one, leave his father and mother. So single guys, you need to go home, pack up your stuff, grow up, get out of your parents' basement, find a job, okay? Number two, he says he's going to leave his, his father and mother, he's going to hold fast to his wife, okay? Not, not hold fast to his wife, not hook up with another woman, not, not uh, but to receive the, the gift that God brings to you. Listen, sex is for men who are married, not boys who can't keep their pants up or make a commitment to a woman. It's for men who are married. And that's a covenant. That's where God says, this is where it ought to be happening. Sex ought to be happening within this covenant bond of marriage, okay? And then he says, and the two shall become one flesh. So that's, that's, that's the third thing. In the act of consummating the marriage, in the act of sex within marriage, the husband and wife become one flesh. And we're going to talk about this. It's very fascinating, some of the stuff that physiologically happens. But, but I think that means... They became one flesh in that moment, and I think it means that over the course of their marriage, they were becoming increasingly one flesh, okay? So, so, 
And then look how it ends. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Sex was great. God was good. God was glorified. Okay? Shame and guilt, nowhere in sight. It's amazing. God says, I brought them together. They had sex. They did this. It was my idea. Okay, God, God didn't like put them to the, the two of them together, go get an espresso and turn around and go, whoa, what, what are you doing? I did not intend for you to do that, right? No. So I did this. I made this. It, it's my idea. Now, so that, that's what he intended. Now, now, what happened? What happened? Where did it go wrong? Because some of you go, that's not our marriage. That's not where we are. It's not amazing. I'm not sure. It's maybe even non-existent. Well, if you know the story, you know that Adam and Eve sin and everything changes. The whole Bible is about the whole curse of the fall and God's overcoming that through Jesus Christ. And so we inherit by nature the fall out of that sin. And, and so what was created to be this glorious gift that God says, Go. And I'm going to show you this. It's amazing what the Bible says. Has been turned into either a God or has become gross and neglected. Okay? So, so let's talk about each of those. And we'll start off with sex as God. Okay? I told you. This would probably be where I came from. Okay? I mean, and I think where a lot of guys come from. Okay? Now, here's what happened to some of us. We take sex. And this is what's happened to our culture. We take sex and we make it our identity. I'm straight, I'm gay, I'm bi, I'm lesbian, whatever. Now, what is that? It's who I am is all about sex. Okay, that, that sex is God. Now, I'm not, this is not gay bashing. This, this happens to heterosexual men and women. Okay, it is, it is the dominating characteristic of your life. And here's the thing. The Bible says that worship, this is, worship is what you and I do with our bodies. Romans 12.1. You, you go, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. So you, you cannot separate what you do with your body from worship of Jesus. Okay, uh, see, see, what I do with my body is not just physical. It is deeply, deeply spiritual. And so there's all kinds of ramifications of that, not only sexually, but how you care for your body. It is a spiritual thing. I think this is what the, 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 the Corinthians misunderstood, right? They were influenced by the idea that their spirit was good, Okay, now, now follow me here. Their spirit was good and their bodies were bad or irrelevant or God didn't really care or whatever. And, and so one didn't impact the other. Now, now look, so they would go, it doesn't matter if I have sex with anyone anywhere. What matters was my spirit. Do, do you see how this has modern expression? I can't tell you how many people, young people, it doesn't matter that my boyfriend and I are having sex. I'm still a Christian. We, we love Jesus. It doesn't matter that I'm homosexual. God doesn't care about my sexuality. He only cares about, I love Jesus. I love people. No, he deeply cares. What you do with your body matters. And Paul goes on to say, look, he says, don't you know in, in Romans that your bodies are members of Christ? Don't you realize your bodies physically now are the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? So glorify God, he says, in your body. That, that's how you worship. See, some of you go, why do you Christians make such a big deal about sex outside of marriage? What's the, and some of you even are Christians, and you'd say that. I sleep with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, I don't really care about it. Look, at, I'll, I'll tell you the problem. The problem is idolatry. Hear me. If you're doing that, you're an idolater. Yeah, that's not possible. I'm a Christian. No, you're an idolater. No, I'll tell you why. You may call yourself a Christian all day long, but the problem is it, the problem is not sex. Okay. 
every time you have sex with someone who is not your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, girls, your boyfriend just tells you, I love you, baby, and you jump in the sack together, and you say, I'm a Christian, you're making a choice about what you're going to worship. And you're choosing to worship that man, that woman, or sex, and not worship Jesus. Because your Bible says don't do that. I think Driscoll, in this book, you'll read it, he's got it right. He says when you do that, your, pe- your bed is a pagan altar, your boyfriend is a pagan priest, and your body is a living sacrifice. You're worshiping something else other than Jesus. I mean, back in Romans 1, Paul goes... Paul in Romans 1, basically, if you want an outline, tells you uh, about the birth of an idolater. How do they come about? And you know how they come about? An idolater happens when Paul says, you exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. Now, did you hear this? You worship the creature. You decide, you go, I know what scripture says, but I want to believe something else. It's right for me. I know the Bible teaches I shouldn't have sex with it outside of marriage, but I love this man. I love this woman, and I think it's okay. You've just exchanged the truth of God for your own little personal lie. And then he says, what happens then is that you worship God created things more than the creator. Well, I don't bow down to anything, Chris. Oh, yes, you do. Right? Created things like the human body. Created things like a boyfriend. Created things like a girlfriend. Created things like sex. God created it. And the end result, Paul says, is that God, hear this, he says in Romans 1, God gives them up to their passions. This is interesting. So when your passion is anything less than worshiping God and enjoying the creation he's given us, the worst thing that can happen to you is for God to give you the desires of your heart. If the desire of your heart is first and foremost not God and serving him and being obedient to him, And God says, I'll give you over to your passions. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You keep reading Romans 1, and you'll find out what ends up happening. You become a pervert. I was watching, I I love documentaries. I watch Netflix all the time, and I, I, for some reason, my kids are like, Dad, please. So I'm I'm sitting there watching one, and I don't know, I just, any, and, and so I pick up this one, and it's about this, I don't even watch wrestling. I like well, UFC, but I don't watch wrestling, you know. And, and, uh, and there's this, this one on this, this guy who's a wrestler. And I'm like, oh, well, whatever. So I start watching this. He's washed up, you know, from, you know, any of you watched wrestling in the 70s or whatever. I guess he was a big star then. But he, he, um, he began talking about in one little segment, he began talking about his sex life. He talked about while he was on the road, you know, he's this big star, whatever. He's got a wife at home. Starts off and he has adultery with another woman. Starts hiring prostitutes. Starts giving himself over to these other things. He's like, you know, I want want more, I want more, I want more. So then it went from a prostitute's not good enough, I have to hire two. Two aren't good enough, I have to hire three. Three women aren't good enough, I now got to get weird and bizarre. And he says on the camera, it got to the place where I couldn't even go home and have sex with my wife anymore. What happened? He exchanged the truth of God for a lie. He became a pervert because God gave him over to his passions. Happens every time. See, when sex is your God, you will go to very perverted places. You'll end up doing things that God never intended. And this is Romans 1, homosexuality, lesbianism, adultery, pornography, pedophilia, bestiality. Now listen, if these are your sins, and you're here today, and you're, I'm not, I'm not here to simply say stop it. 
No, that's never the goal. I want you to hear me. It's, I don't care what sin we're talking about. The goal is never to just stop sinning, but that you stop worshiping sex and start worshiping Jesus. See, you got to exchange. You got to do the other exchange. You quit, you quit exchanging the truth of God for a lie, and you go to God, and you go to Jesus and say, I worship Jesus. I don't worship this lie. See, the answer to sex is God is Jesus is God. That's your answer. Now, that doesn't mean you're like this wrestler and you're just going to all kinds of crazy places. It may mean that you're like me. You're a happily married man or woman and yet you begin to realize that you tend towards sex as God. Sex is going to answer all our problems. Sex is going to make sure everything's good in our marriage. Whatever. And so whatever form that comes in, the answer is the same. You repent. You know what repentance is? Just turning around. It's realizing, wait, whoa, the Bible just showed me I'm wrong. I got to turn away from that. Not turn away from sex. I'm saying, you turn away from saying, that's my God. I put all my hopes in that. Right? I, this is going to save me out of all my trouble. No. And, and this is how we think. I mean, we think like, like, where does your mind go when you're troubled? Does it go to sex? Where, 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 what do you run to when you, when you feel disturbed? It's sex. I mean, all these things. You go, no, that, that's me. And I got I to gotta worship Jesus. Not see sex as a God. Okay, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is sex is gross. Now, now, now look. There are people, there are institutions uh, that think, well, God may tolerate sex, but only barely, right? And then what he really meant sex for and what it ought to be limited to is procreation, right? Having babies. Okay, well, then, by the way, this has a long, long tradition within the church. Okay, I, I feel like it is sort of embedded in our Christian psyche to some way, to some degree or another. So, like Michelle, okay, would she have ever said it's gross? Maybe she wouldn't have used those words, but she have said, you know, it, until I'm married, it's really dirty. And so, some of you felt that way when you finally got married. Some of you think that way. You're single right now. And some of you, maybe ladies and even guys, you're like, you know, can't, can't, can't. It's terrible. It's bad. It's awful. No, no, it's, it's, it's not terrible, bad, or awful. It's, it's saying it needs to wait till a certain moment. Okay? Many of the church fathers, you know, these early church fathers that we have in history, I mean, they frowned upon sex unless it was for procreative purposes. Okay? If, you weren't, if you weren't trying to have a baby, they would say, oh no, you can't. In fact, there were some that said they would rather the human race be extinct than people have sex. This is, this is, this is churchmen talking. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's a guy named James Brundage uh, who, who created a calendar. He actually looked at these things called... Uh, um, uh, the, the, these medieval penitentials that monks would use to teach the masses and they came up with a way to basically stop people from having sex for probably over half the year. Couples, married couples. I mean, so, so there's this, uh, I, I can't show it to you because there was no way to put it on the screen. It was just too small and grainy. There's this little flow chart that actually is like, okay, well, uh, feeling like you want to have sex? If the answer is yes, then go to the next one. Are you married? Yes, go to the next one. Is this your wife? Yes, go to the next one. Married more than three days? Yes, go to the next one. Is your wife menstruating? No, go to the next one. Is your wife pregnant? No. Is your wife nursing a child? No. Is it Lent? No. Is it Advent? No. Is it Whitsum week? Is it Easter week? No. Is it uh, a feast day? No. Is it a fast day? No. Is it Sunday? No. Is it Wednesday? No. Is it Friday? Is it Saturday? No. Is it daylight? Are you naked? No. Are you in the church? No. Do you want a child? Yes. Well, then go ahead, but be careful. No fondling, no lewd kisses, no oral sex, no strange positions, only once. Try not to enjoy it. Good luck and wash afterwards. <laughs> okay. Now, now, that's extreme, right? Origen, one of our church fathers, wanted to kill his feelings of sexual desire, so he took a knife and castrated himself. Ambrose taught people that sexual desire was the result of the fall, and so uh, he went so far as to suggest that if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen, we would, as a human race, somehow uh, have reproduced ourselves through some vegetable. I guess you eat this and you become pregnant. Augustine actually 
commended married couples for not engaging in sex. So, so this notion of sex is dirty and wrong is buried deep into our Christian psyche. Some people, they do this. A few years ago, I preached in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is an entire book of your Bible. We'll look at part of it in a minute uh, of your Bible that talks about sexual intimacy within marriage. And some people say, no, no, that's not about sex. That's an allegory. And so they allegorize the Song of Solomon because they simply cannot believe that God would allow that kind of frank talk in the Bible. There's no way God talks like that. But listen, if sex is gross... If it's gross and it's only meant for procreation and sexual desire is bad, then I want to make a couple of points here. First of all, your body doesn't make sense. Okay, you understand, God got into the nitty gritty details of sex. He created fluids, tissues, nerve endings, okay? And if, if God created sex purely for procreation, uh, then, then your body, my body doesn't make sense. Look at God created men and women, I think we can all agree on this, with sexual organs that exist for no other reason than the enjoyment of sex. Okay, look, again, I'm really not trying to be crass. But I got to say this. If sex is purely for procreation, why does a woman have an orgasm? It, she doesn't need to. There's only one explanation. There's only one explanation, and that is that God got down there and said, we're going to make this pleasurable. There's no other reason for that. That's not procreation. And then, okay, so your body doesn't make sense, but look, Scripture doesn't make sense. Like, like turn with me to, uh, to Song of Solomon. It's right after uh, Proverbs. It goes Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, and then Song of Solomon. And if you've got the, the Bibles there, uh, go ahead and go to, um, to page 562. Let me, I'm just going to read you. This is Scripture, okay? If you want to allegorize it and say, this is Jesus in the church, be my guest, but I think you're way off, okay? Chapter 4, Verse 11, listen to this husband and wife talk to each other. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Skip down to verse, uh, ver verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden. The garden, by the way, is a, is a euphemism for, for the woman's body. And let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choices fruit. Now the man talks. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. And then these people go eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Go down to chapter 7. Listen to this man. He's going to start talking to this woman. How beautiful you are. Uh, your feet in sandals, O oh noble daughter. How your rounded thighs are like jewels. Your, the work of a master's hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat. Uh, guys, just a little word of advice there. Never call your wife's belly a heap of anything. But <laughs> this is Solomon. Okay. Encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. You're ne you see what he's doing? He, he, he's starting at the bottom and he's working his way up. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes, pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bathramin. Your, your nose like a tower of Lebanon which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in your tresses. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O oh, loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters. I say, I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. Now, listen, that ain't pro creation. That's like, this is awesome. We are really, really enjoying this moment. That's what it is. This is, to, this is a couple that is saying, look, you know what? If procreation happens, it happens, but this is a great night. There's no other way to read that. 
So, so here's the point. <laughs> to come to the conclusion that sex is gross or unbiblical, or, or you know, or, or is gross or, 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 or not biblical, is an unbiblical conclusion. And if you draw, have drawn that conclusion in your marriage, and sex, because of that, is rare or non-existent, then then you need to repent. It's, you're, you're exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Listen, here, here, I was astonished actually to read this. On the one hand, research tells us that Christian married couples have the most satisfying sex lives of anybody on the planet. That's not me talking, that's research. But... Research tells us that 31% of married couples, Christian or non-Christian, have sex less than once every month. One in three. One in three of the couples in this room have sex once per month or less. 17% of married couples, this is astonishing to me, about one in six have sex less than two times in a year. Now, I'm guessing there can be all kinds of reasons that go into that, whether it was you were sinned against, you were taught something, whatever. You've identified sex as bad, as gross. And for some of you, it's, it's not, again, it's not just because you decided, oh, I don't like sex. For some of you, there's a past there. And there's been sins committed against you. And, and, or maybe your own past sexual sins. And, and I want you to know, I want you to know there's hope and that the power of the Holy Spirit, he can renew your mind and you can move beyond that to what God intended. And what God intended is the final thing I want to tell you, and that's that sex is a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift that God made for you in marriage. Okay, this is what God wants for you. He doesn't want sex to be your God and supplant him. And he doesn't want it to be gross where there's none of that oneness within marriage. He wants it to be received as a gift for you and your spouse to fully, I mean, listen, you go back and read Song of Solomon, fully enjoy See, now look, at, nobody raise their hand here. I don't want to embarrass you. I want you to answer this on your own. How many of you tend to see sex as God? And then how many of you, and let's talk to married couples for a second, how many of you would lean more toward that sex as gross position? Okay, Michelle, more on the gross side. Me, more on the God side. And it's interesting, how many of you, if you answer that question, would say, I'm married to someone at the opposite end of the spectrum from me? See, now, here's what I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you. The goal for me is not to get Michelle to come over and worship my God. And the goal for her is not to get me to come over and say, no, this is, this is gross, okay? The goal is for both of us to go, sex is a gift. God made it. Now, why did he do this? Let me talk about how sex is a gift, can be, if you'll let God do it in your marriage. Okay? Let me give you a few things. Number one, for pleasure. To sheer pleasure. I mean, we've been talking all throughout this series that God wants you to enjoy your marriage. And if you're not enjoying your marriage, we've talked about some reasons why you might not be in the last couple of weeks, but here's another reason. One of the greatest avenues for producing joy in your marriage and knowing pleasure is sex. Okay, pleasure, hear me, isn't a bad thing. It's not. It's a God thing. Pleasure was God's idea. Okay, some of you know I'm a C.S. Lewis. I just think, you know, the world of this guy. Um, and, and he wrote this amazing book, many of you have read, called Screwtape Letters. Screwtape Letters is, is he, him writing as an 
an, a, a, an elder demon to a younger apprentice who's his nephew. Okay, so, the, so it's these series of letters. It's these letters where he writes about all kinds of things about human nature, but you have to hear that it's a letter from one demon to another demon, and they hate God. And God is the enemy. So now listen to what Screwtape, the uncle, says to his nephew in one letter. Never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures all our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. I love that. See, some of you feel guilty for feeling pleasure. That's not from God. Can pleasure be perverted? Yes. Has pleasure been perverted? Absolutely. But pleasure can also lead you to worship. David says, in your presence is fullness of joy. He's talking to God. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, so I want you to hear this today. That God is giving you a gift within your marriage that he wants to bring pleasure. Well, Chris, I don't find any pleasure in sex. Well, okay, you know, you might have to talk to somebody. If you literally say, it's painful for me, or there's, then, then you probably need to go to a doctor. And I, I'm not trying to, I, I, I mean this. Because it should be. And it should be something that you work on together to make pleasurable. Okay? Number two, I think it's pretty obvious, sex is for making babies. Everybody in this room is because somebody had sex. Okay? <laughs> okay, I have four of them. <laughs> okay, I've got four babies, four kids. So they're wonderful. But God, isn't this interesting? That God takes the most intimate moment and produces a child out of it. Only God would think of that. Number three, sex is for protection. I want you to hear me and hear me very, please. This is huge. Okay, Paul, we're going to look at it right now, but Paul, and you, you, you write this in the margin, do whatever you want. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, Paul talks to husbands and wives and he says, don't you deprive one... In fact, he says, he goes so far as to say, uh, husband, your body is not yours, it's hers. Wife, your body is not yours, it's his. How different from our modern feminist individualization, you know, I, it's my body. No, no, if you're married, Michelle's body, the Bible says, is mine. My body is hers. It's just this mutual, it's yours. Okay, now here's what he says, though. He says, don't you dare deprive one another of sex except by mutual consent. And then he says, and only for a short time. Now, this is Paul talking. This is in your Bible, chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And then he says, you do it for a short time, and you go off and he says, and that's when you maybe want to go pray. Maybe there's something going on in your relationship. You want to pray about that. But you go and you pray and you hurry up, come back together and get busy. This is my paraphrase, okay? <laughs> and you know what he says? He tells us why. He doesn't just send it and say, that's what you ought to do. You got to have more sex. He tells you why. You know why you ought to be really sexually active in marriage? Because Paul says, if you deprive one another for more than a very short time, and that by consent, then you, and this is his words, give Satan an opportunity for temptation. Hmm. I bet if there's couples in here, and this is happening, and there is severe deprivation going on, I, would, I could sit you down and I would say to you, do you love your husband? Yes. Do you love your wife? Yes. And let me push back on that for a minute. I want you to hear me say very clearly, there is never an excuse for adultery. Ever. Ever. It's unbiblical. It's a sin. But there is never an excuse for long periods with no sex in marriage. 
So I've met couples where you, 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 you hear the first, and you know, I'll use kind of husbands and wives here. You know, the, the, the wife will come and she'll be like, my husband's cheating on me. And, you know, my husband's masturbating. My husband's flirting with other girls. My husband's emotionally involved with someone else. My husband looks at porn. I can't live with this anymore. And I'm like, you're right. What a jerk. Bring him into my office. I'm going to tell him what for. And the guy comes in. What's going on? And what do you, you what, what, what's all this happen? Well, did she tell you, like, we haven't had sex in over a year. Why? I don't know. She doesn't like it. Okay, now look, hear me. I'm not going to say, oh, then adultery's fine. Go look at porn. Go hire a prostitute. No. I'm going to, on the one hand, look him in the eye and say, okay, I get it. And if, and if that's your cross to bear for the rest of your life, you must not violate Scripture. But I'm going to look her in the eye and go, hey, I just heard the rest of the story. What are you doing? Do, 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 can you look me in the eye and say, I love my husband, but I don't love him enough to protect him from satanic temptation that comes from denying him sex within this marriage? Don't tell me you love him. Don't tell me you love her. You're both sinning. And the goal is for you to look and say, this is one of the reasons God gave this to us. So that I can go, this protects me. This protects her. Number four, sex is for comfort. I mean, look, there's just times in your marriage when men... There, there, there's, there's, there's grief. There, there's things that are heavy on your heart. And, and, and it's amazing how just being together in sexual union, just it's like a balm. It's like a salve that just kind of, look, it, the grief is still there, but it's, it helped. Number five, sex is for knowledge. In fact, you know, the, 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 the one word the Bible uses, and I love that in the ESV, this translation on your, on your chairs, still uses the word, you know, Adam knew his wife. Joseph did not know Mary until after uh, Jesus. What are they talking about? They're talking about sex. And I love that, and I'll tell you why. Because, because... You, when you give yourself to someone in sexual union, you are letting them know you in a way that no one else does or should. And this is why if you are sexually promiscuous, boy, you're letting everybody know you deeply. And you've got a fractured heart. And I mean, the Proverbs are going to talk about You've just let, as the Proverbs talking about, your seed spill out in the street to anybody who wants it. And the Bible says this is one of the ways that husbands and wives get to know each other in deeply, deeply spiritual ways. Number six, sex is for oneness. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We, we read it just a minute ago. They will become one flesh. Okay, so over a lifetime, sex as a husband and wife, they're becoming one. I want you to listen to this quote by, uh, by Dr. Stephen Arterburn. He says this. I found this fascinating. Sexual pleasures is one of the most intense human experiences. Physically speaking, when a man and woman are together, this is fascinating, a chemical is released into the brain called an opioid. It's an opium-like. It just literally means opium-like. It doesn't mean it's opium. And he says this. Listen. Apart from a heroin-induced experience, nothing is more physically pleasurable. This is a wonderful thing in a committed marriage relationship because it actually helps bond two people together and bring joy to living together and building a relationship. But now what happens? What happens when I give my body and that bond to this girl and 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 this girl. It's like taking a piece of tape and laying it on the carpet and pulling it up once, still a little bit sticky, pulling it up twice, still a bit, pulling it up, and pretty soon, what happens? I can't stick to anything. I've given myself so many times, I can't even stick to you anymore. Now listen, if that's you, I'm telling you, there's hope, there's mercy, there's grace in Jesus Christ. And he can heal you. 
See, God wants what's best for you. Hear me. He's not a cosmic killjoy. He really, he wants us to know real connection with him and with our spouses. He wants us to grow in oneness throughout our lives. So so let me ask you, where are you? Married couples, single guys, single gals, where are you? Is sex a god? Is it is it gross? And if you're at either of those extremes, let me tell you, you need to repent. That's not a bad word. That's not I want you to walk out of here hanging your head. That's realizing, oh my gosh, the Bible says one thing, Jesus is teaching one thing, and and I'm walking away from him. I want to turn around and run to him. And he's there going, when it comes to this whole issue of sex, then, then look, I'll redeem it. And I'll make it a gift. Look it. Only Jesus is God, and you don't call anything that God created gross. See, Michelle and I came to our marriages in some ways from opposite sides, but through lots of prayer, talking, 23 years of working, and by the mighty, mighty grace of God, we're growing together. And we now see sex is a gift. It's a gift that God wants us to enjoy because God is a God of joy. He's a God of pleasure. And he says, you do this in the sphere that I've created and you'll know pleasures forevermore. Let's pray together.